Thank you for coming. Welcome. And uh, this morning we have a very special guest, Celine Silvestri. She's Italian. And she came here about uh, 2005, you said, huh? 2015. 2015. Yeah. 15. Uh, while she was doing uh, PhD. So I was a co-director of a PhD. And then she uh, went to work with uh, Fico, FICO, FICO. It's a fancy show. <laughs> FICO. FICO. <laughs> and uh, she worked in uh, London, London. Then she moved back to Italy, in Torino. Yes. Torino. And then she moved again back to this continent, MIT. And uh, where she's a research scientist, and she's here today. So she is a network by herself. She is a bridge, and she's done uh, both academia and industry, and the link between the two. So she's going to tell us her story. So welcome. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for joining, and also thanks to those that are online. Thank you so much. Um, so, as Professor Laporte just mentioned, um, if my clicker works, I, try, I tried it and it was working earlier. Let's do this. So, as Professor Laporte mentioned, I've been here. Um, I've been so lucky to work with him and with Maria um, for four years in Montreal. And this is one of the first pictures I took when I moved in January, 2015. Um, so for me, it's a very, very special day today. Uh, but um, as Professor Lopar was saying, I'm Italian and um, I want to tell you just a few words about me so that you know me besides my journey um, in innovation research. My full name is Elena Lidia Stefania. And the reason for that is we all have three names in our, in our family. And Stefania is there just because it sounded nice with, uh, with the first two. Lydia is my grandma name. And that's because in Italy, we all have this tradition of giving to our kids the name of our grandparents. But my dad decided to cut and to break that tradition. And he chose my name before I was even born and before meeting my mom, which was nice enough to let him uh, call me Selena. And as Professor Laporte was saying, in my spare time, I moved to another country. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's just a bit about me. But um, let's move to the agenda for today. I will uh, spend a couple of words about, um, on the um, uh, labs to which I belong, which is the MIT Intelligent Logistics System Lab, and another lab that is also led by uh, my, my boss, Matthias Winkerbach. Um, which is the CAVE lab that stands for Computation Analytics, Visualization and Education, because we do work a lot um, together um, with the team from the CAVE lab. I will just then move to an overview of where operation research brought me, and uh, I will then go deeper in some of the projects on which I've worked in, um, in this, I would say, 15, 15 years more or less. Um, Okay, the Intelligent Logistics System Lab is actually a lab that was created just a few months ago with the idea of addressing this need of building models that are at the intersection between operational research and machine learning. And it's born out of another lab, which has been there for almost 10 years, which is called, it was called the Megacity Logistics Lab. The idea, um, the reason why it was rebranded was because of two reasons. Uh, first, assessing this need of building models at the intersection between OR and machine learning, but also because at the beginning, the, the lab was a lot focusing on, on last mile logistics in mega cities, but now we do work um, in, in, in general in all the in problems that are related to supply chain and access design and, and not only limiting to last mile logistics. Um, but what is very important for us and the reason why I wanted to mention also the CAVE lab is because we do work um, together all the time. Matthias created the lab about seven, eight years ago with the idea of bridging, of bridging the gap between mathematical models and applications. 
that um, would allow business users to work with the very, very technical mathematical solution uh, that the team of the Mega City Logistics Lab was developing. And um, now the Intelligent Logistics System Lab develops. Uh, but with the idea of uh, helping business users to work with these applications without really having the need of knowing the technical piece behind. Um, because they are those that actually know the problem. Uh, we usually don't have a real knowledge of the business problem, so they need to work with that. And that picture, and also this one, are pictures of the lab, as you can see, it was really built to, um, to have people moving around this very huge um, iPad, touching it, discussing, looking at the big screen, and, and, and comparing KPIs, visualizing um, charts and maps. So the project I will um, present to you today, uh, on which I've worked uh, since when I joined MIT, is a project that um, definitely has the mathematical piece, but it has the user interface to enable the partner company with which we have worked to work with the solution that we developed. OK, so um, where my work stands. So as, I, as Professor Laporte was anticipating, um, I lived in Barcelona during my master, and that's the moment in which I started to love operational research. I decided to do my PhD. I was in Italy for that, but I came to Montreal at a visiting student for almost uh, 10 months. And then I came back um, after defending my PhD as a postdoc, uh, and I worked with Professor Laporte and, and, and Professor Rancourt. And, um, in 2019, I moved to London and I joined a company called FICO um, as a pre-sales technical consultant in optimization. And then in May last year, I moved um, to, Mon uh, to, to Boston and I joined the uh, CTL as a research scientist. And I don't really know where I'm going next. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's probably a nice place. <laughs> Uh, but um, if we look at the, if we position on the theory practice continuum, the jobs, the, the, the work I've done, I can definitely say that the work I've done during my PhD was very, very theoretical, um, with zero or close to be zero possibility of applying the uh, work I was working on. Um, I moved um, a lot during the postdoc on the project we worked um, we worked on um, in the humanitarian logistics sector, and I will talk about one of them. Then during my experience in FICO, uh, there was probably close to zero theory, but a, a lot of the project that I was discussing were very practical and needed to be used on a daily basis by partner companies. What I'm doing now, I'm working, well, I just, we just completed this project. It was a project that originated with, from a collaboration with the partner company of the CTL. And um, it's very, it's, it's really meant and developed to be used by the, the company on a day, well, not on a daily basis, but um, to take decisions. Um, the idea for us is now to, um, as a next step, is try to use what we have learned and um, do a research project starting from that. Without uh, the hope and the intention is we want to bring a contribute to the literature without losing the, the piece that makes it very practical and usable from, like, from um, a business perspective. OK, so um, I spent a few words on a very, <laughs> I think it's, the name is really nice, actually, the Rainbow Cycle Cover Problem, which is a problem on which I worked with Professor Laporte and my professor from, from my supervisor doing the PhD. And um, the problem is defined on a graph, which is connected, undirected, and is age colored. So all the arcs of, of, the, of the graph have colors. And um, a rainbow cycle of the graph is defined as a collection, a cycle of the graph that in which all the arcs have different colors. And the objective for us was to identify a covering of rainbow cycles with the minimum number. So this is an example of a possible solution with four different rainbow cycles. That's, of course, a trivial uh, single node. So it's a trivial uh, rainbow cycle. But 
our objective was to identify the solution with the minimum number of single sites. Now, what we wrote on the paper is uh, age color graphs are used to represent many real world situations in which it is necessary to distinguish between different types of connections. For example, color can represent modes of transportation, telecommunication fibers, etc. The truth is that it's a very complex theoretical problem has been proved to be NPR, and it provides a rich variety of mathematical properties uh, that, I, that we explore. Uh, but that's the truth. So I, let's say close to be impossible to apply. But, and I promise this is the, the first and very last slide in which you will see constraints, and I'm not going into the details of them, but um, these are some of the valid inequalities that we found, and I call them the star, the candy, and the path valid inequalities. They just say, the first one says, well, because I'm looking for a rainbow cycle, if a vertex belongs to a cycle, all, at most one arc of color blue, but not any color can be selected in that, in that cycle. This is extending a bit, and it's saying, the candy one is saying, either B and U are in two different cycles, which means we will not select the red arc, or we can at most select one of the blue on the stars. And the path constraints, it's just an extension of, of the candy one. So um, if you want to learn more, please <laughs> uh, follow this, uh, this QR code. But just to summarize, we solved the problem using a branch and cut approach. And the results that we, we, we ran several uh, analysis and the results show that the problem is very, very difficult to solve, even for very small instances. Um, and that the, the valid inequalities that we found um, were useful to, uh, to improve the quality of the lower bounds. The takeaways for me are that this work together with the other works I've done during the PhD, which were as well very theoretical, have increased a lot my technical knowledge, have sharpened my problem solving skills, and have also trained me to think uh, both deeply and broadly. Um, but I'm very happy that after that experience, I moved to something that was um, more applied and that could actually help um, people in need. So um, during my PhD, Professor Laporte invited me to attend a class, a seminar that um, related to a project that Maria had been working during her PhD and I, I loved it. So uh, during my postdoc, I started to work also with you. With either. And the project that I'm going to present today is related to optimizing access to drinking water in remote areas, and we apply this to Nepal. Um, is a work in, during this work, we have collaborated with the Austrian Red Cross, the Swiss Red Cross, um, the Nepal Red Cross, and the University of Salzburg. The reason why we started to work on this project is because in 2015, in 2000, um, sorry, in uh, 2015, the Nepal was hit by two very strong earthquakes, and these earthquakes um, affected um, many areas of Nepal, but mainly the, the most affected area were rural and difficult to reach. And um, there was the need of rebuilding the, the water tap system after the earthquakes because um, people didn't have water. And the very important thing to highlight here is that in Nepal, in those areas, people don't have water in their houses. So the problem, the problem we needed to solve was to um, build a solution to support the restoration of the water system, thinking that we needed to locate water taps into, um, into, the, into the region, but not into the houses of the of the of the, the people, which means we needed to understand where to locate water taps so that people could go on a daily basis to collect the water they needed for that day. So as you can imagine, it's not um, it's not possible for, for people to collect water if when they need to collect water to walk um, a, a huge amount of meters per day. So the, the primary objective for us was to decide where to locate with the top so that people could have an easy access to those. And the easy access was given from some national standard that we needed to respect. As a secondary objective, 
we also needed to understand um, how one, I mean, look, okay, we locate the water stocks, but how do we ensure that the water from the water sources can actually reach those water stocks? And the reason for that is because um, in Nepal, um, we didn't have uh, pumps, so we needed to build a gravity fed water system. So <clears throat> these were our two objectives. And this is an example of solution that we aim to build in which, as you can see, there is a network of trees that brings water to the water tubs. And then the, 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 this other part of the problem is what is actually our primary goal is to locate water tubs within areas that allow us to respect the national standard. So this is an example of a solution we were um, aiming to build. And as I was saying, the very one very important thing was that we needed to take into account how much people would need to work, work on a daily basis to reach those water stops. So we were given um, preferred distances, which is they cannot walk more than 150 meters in horizontal. And that's something that was very um, tricky come out to, to deal with is that we also needed to consider the vertical distances. The reason for that is that Nepal is a very um, mountain, is a very mountain area. So that's not um, something that we could just ignore. And there were exceptional distances, which would allow us in exceptional cases to extend to 250 meters horizontally and 80 meters vertically. Regarding the, the, the wood, the gravity fed system, we needed to understand, okay, but how can we make sure that we can bring water from a source to a, to a, to a location for a water tower? To do that, we started to analyze, okay, how does the gravity fed system work? For sure, it's impossible to get water to a water tower that has a higher elevation than the source, but also to a place that even if it's below, to get there, we need to go higher than the location of the water source. So this is out, but does it mean that every time the water source is higher and there is no point in the path um, that is uh, higher than the water source, we can reach that path? No. The answer is no. We needed to make sure that there is a formula that is called the William and Alton condition that says that if the elevation of the source minus the elevation of the path minus the distance between the two multiplied by a given factor that depends on the pipe, on the dimension, the, the diameter of the pipe, um, the, um, the material, then if this condition is satisfied, yes, you can bring water from the source to the top. Um, so how did we uh, calculate these distances? We adapted the diastra to a three-dimension diastra. Uh, and that was the way we used to calculate both distances. It's for someone else, for TA, it's not for GPS. Sorry? I don't know if they're talking to me. Maybe not. <laughs> so, um, uh, what, yeah, I was saying we, we used the, the three, three dimension, the, the 3D uh, diagonal algorithm for both the distances from uh, houses to water tubs, but and also from water sources to water tubs. So how we decided to, uh, to work with the model or the, with the problem, we took the region of interest and we divided it using a grid uh, of equal size cells. And in these cells, um, I'm going to use cell and nodes as uh, if they are the same thing. So I will probably switch a lot. Um, so once we divided the region using the grid, we identified different type of cells or nodes, which are those in which the houses are, those in which according to the distances that we could actually uh, consider for walking, uh, people could actually go and, and, and collect water. Then there were cells where the water source was, um, was located and something that's called stainer cells, which are cells in which we can go uh, respecting the formula and we might be splitting the network and creating a, a branch. Um, so these are all the nodes of our graph. And if we look at the arcs, if you think about the structure of our solution, we need to take two decisions. We need to take um, decisions about uh, location and allocation. So location of water stops and allocation to houses. 
So we needed arcs that allow us to do this. Um, so arcs that go from households to potential location sites. And then the second set of decisions where the decision related um, more than decision arcs, the second set of arcs are arcs related to the water system. Those arcs allow us to go from water sources or cells that are reachable from water sources to the places where the water taps are located. So um, places where the water taps are located are always in the green area, because we are sure that if they are in the green area from two slides ago, the people can actually reach those. OK, so we had these assignment arcs, and then we had the arcs, um, the, the arcs that could be used for the pipes. We consider, as, as the title was saying, we, we, we apply this on, on, on Nepal. We consider two, uh, two areas, two districts of Nepal, Suspa and Lapidan, and we solve the model um, into a hierarch hierarchical way. Um, we focus first on the water tap location and allocation problem. So where do we locate, where do we locate water taps and which houses are assigned to those water taps that we have located? And once this decision was taken, we use this as a parameter, as an information, and we would solve the second piece, which is the piece in which we actually build the network, the, uh, the pipes. And um, to perform what if analysis on the first, um, on, the, on the water tap location and allocation problem, what we did in the objective function, we, we put some weights um, on the number of water taps on the preferred and on the exceptional distances. The reason for that is that we wanted to analyze what we only want to minimize the water taps and we don't care about the distances. What if we want to penalize? What if we are not uh, really aiming to minimize the water tap, but we want to kind of give a weight to the distances that we want? So that allowed us to do different, um, different analysis and to come up with some recommendations. So again, um, if you want to know more, uh, please um, follow the QR code. They will bring you to the paper that we wrote. Um, but um, as a takeaway from, from this work, um, what I think is important is that, yes, we needed to use the hierarchical approach because the problem was huge and we could not solve all at once. But the decision was actually, um, I think, right also because the main objective was to bring water to people and if then building the pipe would cost a bit more then okay our first objective is was still giving access to water and among all the different solutions that we found we did recommend a solution that provides a good compromise between the number of water tap located so the distances that people needed to walk and the costs to build that pipe um, and this is a takeaway that's a very personal thought. This work deserves to be implemented uh, and to be used uh, because um, it's really developed with the idea of helping people and, 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 and build something that can actually um, bring a contribute to the world. So that's, that's my, uh, my takeaway. Okay, then I decided to leave the academia in 2019 and I joined FICO as a pre sales technical consultant. FICO is a company that uh, I don't know if you are familiar with, with, with FICO. Um, they develop an optimization um, solver, um, but they don't only develop an optimization solver, they, they have something that is called the FICO Express Optimization Suite, which is a tool in which they do have the solver, but they also have a user interface part. So something that allows you to bring optimization in the hands of the business users, which is somehow the sentence that if you read about FICO, you will read right away. And when I joined them, um, for me, it was somehow a wake up call in the sense that I, have, I had a lot to work on the project in like the Nepal and the Caribbean project within my postdoc, um, but that we didn't, we didn't use those solutions um to 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 build and to build something and to to for the let's say to be implemented in reality the reason why i'm saying that was a wake up call because when i joined um my idea was oh i'm going to be a pre-sales technical consultant i'm going to help um companies that come to us 
uh, understand why optimization can help. But in reality, most of the time, I we the demands, the questions I was asked were, what if I want to test a different scenario? What if uh, I want to compare different KPIs, which I'm very interested side by side for different scenarios? And how can I share the different results of the model that you implement with my colleagues? And some of them have a very technical background. Some of them know nothing about mathematics, but they do know the problem. So most of the time, it was not about believing that we could develop something that could reflect their business problem. It was like, but how do I work with that? So <clears throat> that's why I'm saying that was a wake-up call because on a daily basis, I was facing the thing that they were telling us I want to work with it. I want to use it. I don't want you to tell me what to do. I want something that I can play with. So tailored solutions are definitely not, are definitely um, important, and um, but I have not enough. What um, was very clear was that we needed to um, contextualize information and make advanced analytics intuitively accessible and allow the possibility of people to work with uh, black boxes. So we don't need only tailored solution, but we need tailored decision support tool that leverage analytics, but enable also what if analysis and include the possibility of humans in the loop so that um, they can use those solution in a user-friendly way to simulate risks and outcomes and to take informed decision. So I, it's not possible for me to share, uh, you know, like, um, information about the different projects from, from FICO, but that's definitely what I learned. That's definitely what I was, uh, the, the message that was the most important to me uh, based on like for those four years I spent there. And um, one of the reasons why I, I was very happy to accept uh, the offer from Matthias Winkelbach to join his team was because I would have worked with optimization, with operational research, but um, somehow bringing um, the user interface piece into the picture and, and working with, with partner companies to and develop for them solutions that they could use on, um, on, on, their, on their own. So I'm going to talk about the problem that is related to strategic optimization of a large scale supply chain network. This project originates from a partner company. This partner company is, um, it's an international company, but they came to us asking to help them re-optimize their supply chain in North America. So that's where we are uh, focusing, and that's what I'm going to uh, to talk about. So the numbers that you will see are numbers related to their supply chain in North America. So um, <clears throat> they have more than 80 suppliers. They are both national and international, and these suppliers serve a diverse array of products. They already have four established distribution centers, and we don't need to take any decision related to do we locate another distribution center or not, but we need to work, work with the capacities and the inventory constraints of these distribution centers. Then they have more than 1,350 customers. These customers place orders daily for different products in different quantities coming from different suppliers. And each customer, oh, this, this, the first three points are quite like obvious and, 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 and generic, but this is, for example, a very, I would say, one of the first requests that are very ad hoc for this specific company, because they asked us to, um, in our decision, to fix a primary distribution center for each, for each customer. So there cannot be, uh, a customer cannot be served today from a distribution center A and tomorrow from a distribution center B. So we needed to decide one single distribution center that would serve all the time. And um, the reason behind is that they sign agreements with third party logistics. So having that agreement signed makes them save money and gives them a, a, like the, the safeness of saying, my shipments will arrive because I have an agreement with them. So that was a strong, a strong constraint on our side. These products to customers are shipped either full truckload or less than truckload, while we don't ship less than truckload from suppliers to distribution centers and between distribution centers. And each product has a specific lead time uh, that is also supplier dependent. And on the lead time, what I want to highlight is um, 
the lead time considers manufacturing, quality assurance, and transportation, which means that if today I place an order for two products from the same supplier, even if the transportation time is the same, if the manufacturing time is very different, I can get one on month, one on in January and one in March because they have different lead times. So that needs to be taken into account. Okay, so um, our objective was to, um, the solution for us is an optimized large scale network that allows us to distribute multiple products from suppliers to customer going through distribution centers. And we need to take into account the demand of the customers, inventory, safety stock, product lead times, and the capacities um, of, of the network. Um, so basically, which are the decisions that we were asked to take? The very important, the very first one is the one related to, we need to decide a primary distribution center for each customer, and that doesn't change over time. And then at the customer level, the other, the other portion is, are we able every single time to serve the entire demand, or do we have some unsatisfied demand for that customer at that time? On the inventory piece, so on the distribution center decisions, we needed to decide on the at each time period, which was the inventory that we were storing in each distribution center. And then very similar decisions on the arcs from distribution centers to customers, between distribution centers and from suppliers, which is how many, how many trucks do we need? Um, in the case of the outbound, are they full truck loads or less than truck loads? And also, which is the amount of products that we ship per time period? The, only difference that I probably make sense to light is that from supplier to receive, we need to take into account the lead time when we, sh when we consider the number of customers. So grouping these decisions, we can say we have four different set of decisions. Allocations, customers to, uh, this is to customers, orders, when do we order, from where, which amount, um, and, and then, <clears throat> The inventory safety stock levels in each distribution center, and how much do we ship using which transportation mode? One constraint that we uh, that probably is worth um, is worth explaining is how do we deal with the inventory um, level in the network? So we calculate a priori safety stock. This is a deterministic model. We calculate the safety stock based on the demand and on the lead times. So the safety stock is something that we do before running the model, we calculate those. And what we do then is we have a constraint that makes sure that the inventory is always above the safety stock. But when I talk about inventory, I'm not talking only about physical inventory, I'm talking about physical plus intrinsic inventory. This means that if for a given product at time T, there is nothing in transit, and the level of inventory in the, in the warehouses is above the safety stock, I'm happy. But if then at that time I get a demand that makes me go below the safety stock, the model triggers an order. And the order right away is shipped. It's not shipped, but it's considered to be in transit because there is the manufacturing time. <laughs> but um, it's considered to be in transit, which means that the my model will consider the fact that something is actually in this way. So I'm not placing an order again at time t plus one because the inventory is above the safety stock. So I keep responding to my demand using the physical inventory, but along the time between t and t plus l plus one, which is the time in which the product will be physically available because l is the design, the model is not triggering new orders unless. Um, because the safety stock is above, because the inventory level is above the safety stock. So that's somehow we, how we are uh, dealing with, uh, with um, the inventory in the warehouses. That's not all, uh, because it's much more complex than what I said so far. And um, the reasons are other ad hoc requests from the company. Um, some customers only place orders in itches. What it means, it means that most of the customers order in pallets or in cases, but some of them order three shampoo. And three shampoo cannot be, cannot be shipped from every distribution centers because only some distribution centers have each picking capability. So we have a constraint that needs to be considered. Um, we need to have a flag that says this distribution center offer each picking flag, this customer requires each picking. 
so this is saying so. Um, distribution centers have different storage conditions because not all products can be stored everywhere. If they are flammable, they need a dedicated area. And this means that we don't have a unique capacity in each distribution center. We have storage conditions and capacity for each storage condition that needs to be respected. Some products um, require trade carbonization centers, Christmas boxes, three shampoo, one conditioner, and whatever else in the box. Those don't come from suppliers. Those are created in trade customization centers. So from suppliers, we get the components, which is the recipe that says, oh, three shampoo, one conditioner, go in the same box and create a new product. These products go, are created in trade customization centers. Only some of the distribution centers offer trade customization. So um, if we want to analyze the flow of the products that need trade customization, we need to somehow activate the possibility of seeing, okay, what's, what's going to be the network if I'm looking at the trade customization products. Um, and this is a very tricky one. Um, we kind of on the way to work with it, but kind of. When you place an order from a supplier, you need to place an order in minimum order quantities, which or in multiple of minimum order quantities, which means that if you need 70 units, but the minimum order quantity is 100, you need to order 100. And if you need 110, you need to order 200, 300. Um, and that's a very, very tough one. OK, so um, we could not definitely solve this problem all at once. We could not um, do everything that the theory would tell us to do, because it would be just impossible. So we drew uh, some lines. We aggregated the demand at the monthly level. The demands are at the daily basis, but we aggregated them at the monthly level. The reason why we did that, because along the way, we discussed with the company, and they didn't want to give away the possibility of working at the product level. So we could not aggregate products, mainly on the reason where related to the fact that different products have different lead times, and that they come from different suppliers, so it was different, difficult to aggregate. So they were like, we are happy that you don't aggregate and that, sorry, that you don't aggregate products, but then we needed to aggregate the months. So we work with the 12 month time horizon. But the supply chain network are ongoing operations. We don't start a supply chain in month one and we close the supply chain in month 12. And we needed to deal with that because the very first deliverable, when they came, our inventory level was going down and down and down in month 10 to 11 and 12, because there was nothing to serve a month 15. So to deal with that, we, uh, which we call the end of time and beginning of time effects, we did two things. For the end of time, we added three more fake months, which are the repetition of month one, two, and three, because they kind of match looking at the seasonality. So they were happy with that. Um, but the trickier part was the beginning of time effects. Because if you start the network at time one, that, and then you have products that have five monthly times, you need to have the inventory enough for the first four months if you only start placing orders at time one, because your network is starting at time one. So how we dealt with that is, for every product, let's say a product has lead time of four months, we allow to place an order for that product a month minus, minus four. And if there was no demand in month one, then the model would decide to not place a minus four. But if we needed something in month one, there was the possibility to order at a negative time. But we did that ad hoc because we didn't want to create, we needed to keep the size of the problem as small as possible. So, we did that for each specific product for its own lead time. So those that had five has lead time, minus five. Those that had three, minus three, minus 11, it depends. But we did that for every specific product. Um, we could not solve this model at once. So we decided to do something very similar to the Nepal case. That was my learning um, curve. Transportation first, inventory second. So we first decided on the transportation piece and the transportation piece allowed us to fix the decision about the allocation, which distribution center should serve looking at the transportation cost, which customer without caring about inventory. I mean, the constraints on the inventory are still there. So we do know that we can use 
that we have the the, 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 the amount of inventory available um, in the warehouses, the space, but we were not minimizing those costs. So the model could place things wherever wanted, whenever wanted, without, without paying for that. But transportation first allowed us to decide on the assignment and then inventory second, we would re-optimize using the assignment as parameters. So we would drop a lot of decisions um, for the second piece. And the flow for the trade facilitation uh, centers, we run it after in the sense that when they want to look at the flow of their product, getting the recipe in, doing the creating the new problem product and, and sending it out. We do that after solving the full network for all the products that don't need trade customization. And that was again because it was too complicated to solve them at once. The reason why I'm saying human in the loop here is because we took all this decision with them. So every three months they were coming in person, three, four months they were coming in person. We were discussing the difficulties, we were discussing we need to give up on this or give up on that or where do we give up. Um, and we decided together with them what was more important and we wanted to keep, what was less important and we wanted to drop. So um, that was something very important for, for us and also for them. And what was really nice is that in, uh, September, in September, so the very first time they came, we had just solved the outbound piece because we did that in pieces. So we were only looking at the outbound back then. So there was some out inventory, but not completely optimized. And they spent, I don't know, half an hour talking about something that they saw in the charts. And we had no clue what they were discussing because we really don't have an understanding of their distribution sentence. And they were like, oh, why is this thing? why is this the amount of this specific product in this specific warehouse and that's really nice that's that that was something that we wanted to see and that they could do thanks to the fact that we had along the way developed the user interface piece as well so um I, as i mentioned we solve this in two steps we first decide on this is two customer allocations and once those once those decisions are set we um we decide on the inventory orders, place, and transportation part. So um, how do we actually run the, the, the model? We run the model in three plus one, if DCs are enabled, steps. First step is we, um, we looked at the demands and we identified which are the top customers that allow us to get 80% of the total demand. And we focus on those first. So we solve the model only thinking and looking at the demand of the top customers, which covers 80% of the total demand. That gives us, um, it, was, it was making our life easier in terms of solution, but also like we are looking at a huge amount of demand compared to the total. And that's probably the most important part. So we focus on, on the first set, we assign the top customers, deceased two customers, and then we use these as parameters and we then solve the very same model, but top customers are parameters. So those decisions cannot be changed and we rerun the same model for all the customers. So we are deciding, okay, whatever is left in terms of capacity, if you have some capacity constraint in these cases, we probably don't, probably the decision on the second set of customers are not necessarily ideal in terms of cost, but they only bring 20% of the demand. Once these two sets are done, all the customers assignment are parameters and we solve the model to optimize on the inventory side. And if um, we are asked to solve also the piece related to trade customization centers, what we do for those, um, for those specific uh, customers that place orders uh, of products that need to go to a to C, we use those assignments as parameters again, and we solve the model related to the TCs too. Why? Because we were asked to do to allow, we were asked to enable two possible what if analysis. What if the products that go to a TC are directly shipped 
from the TC to the final customer. So don't go through the primary DC. In that case, we don't need the assignment. We just ship from the TC. But they also were curious to know what instead, what if we send back the products from the TCs to the primary DC and then the primary DC ships. And that was for two reasons, because they wanted to see if um, optimizing the costs of transportation from the, from the primary DC, mixing these with other products could save some of. So they wanted to have a picture of both. And um, that's why we need to give an input the, the assignment decisions to the TC's models. And um, as you as probably have been able to, to transfer as, as, a, as an information, they do want to work with the, with the model. They do want to play with the, the scenarios and run different analysis. So what I've presented to you so far is this part. Uh, although many of the decisions that we took on this came from their feedback, but then what the cave uh, team did was to develop to develop the user interface feed. So we have a server, the a cave app server in which all the scenarios are can be run and are stored, and the company from a browser they can just log in into the application and they can look at the different scenarios, different KPIs, the map. And, uh, and and play with it on day on their own. I have probably already mentioned some of the what if analysis that they wanted to do, uh, but this one I didn't mention it yet. At some point there was like, but what if we have a secondary DC that we can use only less than truck load in those cases in which the primary DC is not available? So we we have a flag that they can activate or deactivate in the app to say, let me see if I use a secondary DC, if there are cases in which those DC serve the customer using LTL, but only LTL. Mm, another what if analysis that can be run is what if we, at the, for now I've described you the case in which we allow internal transshipment. So distribution centers can ship uh, between them and, and do the transshipment. What if we don't allow that? So what if suppliers need to ship directly what is needed to each distribution center and there cannot be any rebalancing of the inventory along the way? And uh, the another one which is very important is uh, what if one of my distribution center works partially, so we change the capacities or what is it's completely off? And this comes from the fact that they are like, what if a distribution center is floated? What if for whatever reason that area cannot be used for some time, how much network will change? So I probably didn't mention that, but it's probably very clear they cannot run this on a daily basis. This is not something that is um, any operational decision can be taken um, with this model, but they can definitely run it and they aim to run it every three, four months to look at based on the new demand that they input, how the network looks like, or if they, they want to understand what if I want to, I don't know, I have a, my distribution center with a different capacity because I'm not rent, I don't want to run the entire distribution center, I don't need it, or what if I need to increase it? Um, what if I add each picking capabilities to different distribution centers? Um, just a few words on next steps. So what we would like to do as a next step and make this project a research project. Mm, we want to reduce, because of the right would be impossible, we want to reduce, but not drastically, the product data set. Only focusing on, um, on a subset of product that have deny demand that are ordered frequent, frequently and by most of the customers to have a, somehow a picture that is close to the reality anyway. And we definitely want to move from a deterministic demand to a stochastic demand generating the scenarios based though, on the real demands that we have. And the idea would be uh, using first stage decisions yeah, as the assignment decisions, and the other set are all secondary, uh, second stage decisions. Um, and this is all about the project that on which I worked um, together with the team for the last one year and a half. So just to conclude um, what I, what I 
think is um, I've learned along the way is that for sure tailored solutions are very very important. But what is also more important is that we don't we cannot not only build tailored solution, we need to allow then the business users or the partner company to work with those solutions because they know much better than us. And that closing the gap between academia and industry can be done is a win-win. And in my opinion, it's very fun. So thank you. <laughs>